All right, YouTubers, this video is going to be about replacing the lower intake manifold gasket. Uh, that would be this guy right here. This is the lower intake manifold that is part of a bigger piece that goes all the way back. And below that, where it actually connects to the engine block that you cannot see in this picture, is a gasket. Uh, rest assured, you'll get lots of great pictures. Um, if you've seen my video about replacing fuel injectors, I'm going to post the link to that video here because taking off all of this to the upper intake manifold down to the lower manifold itself, including the fuel rail, all of that is covered in my other video. Uh, so rather than repeat all of that here, Go back and watch that one, and if you've got experience doing that, that'll save you, you know, 30 minutes of video uh, that you don't have to worry about. But basic idea, air box goes off, all the hoses, the uh, PCV, the EGR valve tube. Um, you can take the throttle body off, not necessarily required. Um, in the back, you've got the MAP sensor. There's a booster hose for your brake booster vacuum. And I'm probably missing a couple other things. The biggest difference between this one and the upper intake manifold is that we need to drain the radiator so that we can get this hose off, both the upper radiator hose and the lower radiator hose. Uh, and you can't do that, obviously, when the radiators or when the cooling system is full. So we will drain that. I will show you how to do that just in case you don't know, uh, but everything on the upper, um, <clears throat> we will not cover on this one. One thing I wanted to show you, the reason why I'm doing this, I've had an oil leak on this Jeep for a while and I honestly thought it was coming from the oil pan, but then I was up underneath here doing some work and noticed you can see the oil, if my light would stop flickering, the oil is coming from up there, which if you look at this, where the uh, spark plug is there, there's no oil above the spark plug. So I don't think I have an oil leak way up high. You can see that the header covers or the uh, valve covers there don't have anything. I think my battery's dying. Not, not ideal, but you'll notice there's oil there on the... Uh, on the bell housing and everything back here. I've had an oil leak similar to this on my other Jeep where oil was coming out the back side of the intake manifold, uh, of the lower intake manifold. So I'm gonna give that a shot because I've done the entire oil pan and the new gasket twice now thinking maybe I did something wrong and that did not fix the problem. So here we go. All right, so we're at the spot now where the upper manifold is off. This is where we sort of left off the last video, although in the fuel injector replacement, I replaced all the fuel injectors and removed the fuel rail. I think we can get by without actually remo removing the injectors and the rail. We do have to disconnect the fuel line. I've got some paper here to catch that when we do that. But if you look, the bolts that mount the lower manifold, like that guy, I think we can get to all of them from underneath the fuel rail and save ourselves a little bit of headache in getting, uh, you know, having to undo the injectors and reseat them and all that good stuff. So I'm gonna give that a shot. So I will remove the fuel here. I'm gonna remove all the wiring harnesses from the fuel injectors, remove the 
uh, coolant temperature sensor right there. Also removing this stud bolt and that stud bolt, one of which holds the coil pack on. The other one is a bracket for the alternator. Take both of those off and, oh, this guy right here, it's just a uh, bolt, this plastic piece pulls straight up. It just holds that wire to keep it from touching things. And then the last two wires we'll remove is this guy right here. And we will be reaching way down in there to get that guy just to make sure that we can get this entire wiring harness out of our way and fold it back so that we have complete access to the lower manifold. I should also note this car has been shut off for literally two weeks, so I don't anticipate any pressure in the fuel rail. Uh, if you've just had this parked for a day or so, or you just pulled it into the garage, you will need to relieve pressure in the fuel system. In the original video on changing the fuel injectors, I go through how to do that as well. So hopefully this thing doesn't uh, spew all over the place. Okay, so for this wire here that runs down behind the pulleys down to here, the easiest way to get this out. Now, I have already removed the fender liner because I use that to get out the EGR tube, which you can see behind there. It's so much easier than trying to come in from the engine bay. But the connector we're talking about is right there. So you'll see there's a red security tab, and then you just push that pin in and pull it, uh, as the camera's looking at you, to my right, which is toward the passenger side wheel well. So that's probably the easiest way to do this. Uh, you can try and get to it from the engine bay, but you're probably gonna save yourself a whole lot of trouble if you just come in it from inside of here. Taking off the fender liners, not a big deal. And then the last uh, kind of tricky one is this one here. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, the red tab on mine was completely gunked up, so you couldn't even tell that there was a red safety tab, but there is. Um, so push that red safety tab, and then you can see that big button there at the top, and then uh, the entire uh, housing there slides straight up. So I already took out the uh, coolant temperature sensor, which was right there, and then I also um, used my trim tool and basically got all of the um, wiring harness connectors, these guys right here, pulled those out of where they were connected into the fuel rail. All along the fuel rail, you'll see these. If you don't do that, you can't pull this wiring harness out of your way without doing the entire fuel rail disassembly, which is what I'm trying to avoid. We'll see if I can actually make that work. So that's the last sensor right there and then uh, we should be able to get this wiring harness out of our way wiring harness totally disconnected good news is if you want to really get it out of your way this just runs right to here so you can remove the entire thing and get it out of your way uh, these cam locks are a little tricky so basically what you do is you push this button away from the cam and then can't do it with one hand then this entire handle comes back and you can pull the wiring harness out. So basically this black piece here, push it 
that way to unlock the gray handle and then rotate it this way. Now once you've got these disconnected, the harness that we're trying to get rid of is actually held on by these clips. So just take a trim tool or something and gently pry these out and then you can remove this entire piece and the whole wiring harness that goes with it and uh, get that out of our way. Next will be to remove the two bolts. One's a stud bolt that holds on the alternator mounting bracket and the coil pack. These are 12 millimeter bolts. Uh, I haven't really mentioned any uh, bolt sizes to this point because everything we've done so far has been on the other video, but now since we're starting to do some new things, these will be 12 millimeter. All right, once you get those two off, there is one more underneath this stud bolt here. Same size, 13 millimeter. Do not do what I did last year and drop it down that hole. Of course, we're taking the manifold off, so it's a little bit easier, but uh, Last time I did this, I didn't plug those up, which I would normally do, and I dropped a bolt down there and then had to take the whole manifold off anyway. Not fun. Oh, forgot one more. Around the back side. Two more, actually. Around the back side. Perfect. Right where I wanted it. For the one on uh, this side, back behind, this type of tool is uh, comes in real handy. An angled socket, so it's not the uh, universal joint and then a socket. It's the socket and the universal joint built into one. Uh, comes in real handy for some of these tight spaces. And just so you don't feel left in the dark about what I was doing back here. So this is the other side of the coil pack. And of course now my light's not going to work. So you can see right almost where that connector is above the spark plug. You can see the first stud bolt. I hope if I could just do this. So right there, that's the tricky one that I needed the uh, universal joint socket. The other one is literally right next to it. And the best thing I found was to come straight down over the top. You can see it right there. Just a long handled or a long uh, extension to your ratchet or whatever you're using definitely helps. And then the whole thing just comes right off and leaves plenty of room for us to get to this upper manifold here. Or the, excuse me, lower manifold. Okay. So we've pretty much disassembled everything that we need to, assuming I don't need to do the fuel rail and the injectors. We'll uh, 
say a prayer for that one. So these are the bolts that will be taken off. And there's a few of these along and I'll show you the details when we get there. So the lower manifold, you can't even really tell because it's so caked up. It ends right here on this seam. So this, below this uh, valve cover is the engine block, right? And there's a gasket right here that goes all the way down, makes kind of a V and then comes back up. It'll be a lot clearer when, uh, and when we have all this disassembled, I mean, you can see the oil and the gunk here, down in here. Uh, I'm pretty sure that is making its way all the way down the block, mostly in the back, but some in the front as well. So the next thing that we're gonna to need to do before we can even attempt to loosen any of these, these bolts for the lower manifold is to drain the cooling system so that these hoses that are right now full of coolant and also have orifices that go inside of that manifold we don't spill coolant everywhere pretty easy to do don't judge me for the angry eyes grill this is my son's car but uh, there is a drain cock right my goodness <laughs> easier said than done right there that there hey look at that uh, with this grill it's gonna make it a lot easier to get to and then up underneath the good news is I don't have a skid plate on here if you have a skid plate you'll most likely need to take it off but right here is the actual drain so you can see the part that's sticking out that's the little handle I just pointed out a second ago facing the front of the vehicle I like to put a little bit of like 5 8 tubing over that hole just to guide the coolant into a bucket otherwise it tends to drip all over the frame and everything else that's between here and the ground so put a hose on it or, or don't um, put the bucket underneath and then literally just turn that cock from, uh, you know, uh, counterclockwise, like you're opening any other kind of valve there, and that will drain your coolant system. One last thing I forgot, make sure you take off your radiator cap so that you've got somewhere for the air to get back into the system so that uh, this thing drains a lot faster. Otherwise, you'll be waiting around for a while. So you can see I've got my bucket, my hose, not quite long enough for the bucket, but it's getting around the framing members and the track bar and all that crap to keep it from splashing all over. And then I'm going to reach right in here with a pair of long nose pliers and then just turn that drain valve until it opens and starts leaking coolant. Suddenly, I gotta go to the bathroom. No idea why. But that's uh, pretty much what you're going to get is this constant drip like this. And uh, when this is done, we can move on to the next part. You can hear mine still draining, but uh, it's drained enough that I'm able to take the hoses off just to kind of get ahead of it. I mean, it's pretty simple hose clamp for this one that comes right off the radiator. Remove the hose clamp, pull the hose off. I like to uh, loosen this one as well and then just rotate the whole thing to get it out of my way. Otherwise, it's dangling there. This one, same thing, hose clamp. Um, in the past, I've had real problems with these. Uh, just from the heat and the age, the hose tends to seize to this. Um, you know, the actual, th this is a threaded connector here. Uh, I have, in the past, also had to undo the entire threaded connector to get this off and then uh, figure out how to get it unstuck. Not a fun prospect. These hoses go all the way into the heater core for the uh, HVAC, so it's not an easy thing to uh, take it off from the other end. So hopefully I won't have as much problem with this one. We will see. But anyway, hose clamp, move it back, and then we'll have to do some manipulating to actually get it off of this thing. 
Okay, flashlight's working now, uh, and as three times as bright as I remember that it was. So we should be in good business to take off the uh, lower manifold here. So there are eight bolts, and they basically alternate side to side, here, here, and if you keep going back, you'll see that all along they alternate left, right, left, right, left, right. There are eight total, uh, including two that are back behind the fuel rail there. You can see the tip of one of them where all those uh, coils are. Um, so everything is 10 millimeter except for that stud bolt there. That is 13 millimeter. So eight bolts total, seven 10 millimeter, one 13 millimeter. Uh, I am also going to take a shop vac to this. You can see pieces of the wire braid, some other just crap from age down in there, and I don't really want that to get down into the cylinder, so I'm going to take a vacuum to that real quick just to uh, reduce the amount of crap that can potentially get down into the cylinders. And despite how cruddy that was, it comes out pretty easily. Public service announcement. One thing I forgot to mention is since we did not disconnect the fuel rail, this entire thing is still fill full of fuel you can see by the wetness there at the end. Uh, when you're removing this from <laughs> the engine block, uh, cover this with something, you know, a tiny balloon rubber banded around the end, whatever. Otherwise, you're going to spill fuel um, all over the engine block and your bumper and yourself and everything else when you're taking this out. So uh, cover that first. So here's what this looks like with the lower manifold removed. The gasket is still in there. I'll take that out in a minute, but I wanted to show you just how gunked up this whole area was from repeatedly leaking oil. Uh, you can just see all the way down the remnants of oil everywhere. Uh, not a good sign. That means it very likely is leaking out the back. Um, another thing you'll notice is in the bolt holes, there's oil, and just to show you an example, this is the first bolt that I took out, that stud bolt, that 13 millimeter bolt that goes this way. It is just caked up with oil. Uh, that gasket shouldn't allow that to happen. So just another sign that this gasket is well beyond its useful life. Um, I'm gonna vacuum up more of this miscellaneous crap in here and then take the actual gasket out, and then I'll show you how to clean uh, the surfaces there of the, uh, the cylinder heads so that uh, this is nice and ready for your new lower manifold gasket. Two more bolts I forgot to mention, uh, only because, well, if you're doing this on a, a Jeep that's never had it done, these bolts will be here. I've seen Jeeps that were redone, and for some reason the mechanic doesn't put them back in because they or using a type of uh, gasket that says you don't need them. I have not had luck with those gaskets. Um, so, bolt here, same in the back. You can't tell from the crud, but there's a metal piece that kind of holds that down. Save that and the bolt just in case uh, you need that, depending on which kit you buy. This is uh, another 10 millimeter bolt. So. We'll take those bolts out, and then this is just basically sheet metal. Uh, be careful not to cut yourself. Obviously, use gloves. Uh, it's covered in crap, but uh, that's it. And then we'll have uh, an open manifold for you to see. Once you've got that taken off, uh, just to show you what these look like. So this was sitting on top of the gasket, 
and then the bolt was right there, the only clean spot on the whole thing. Um, but you'll see these like rubber nipples here. They come up through the two holes on that bracket I just showed you. And then usually these, especially if it's never been replaced, is part of a rubber gasket that goes underneath. Um, you can get rid of all of this. Uh, you'll have one in the back as well. So rip this up. Um, we'll have to do a lot of scraping and whatnot anyway, but uh, this gets gotten rid of like all the other stuff. This is what these surfaces should look like after you've uh, cleaned them. So I use a pretty simple scraper like this. Uh, you could use a plastic scraper as well. The key is not to dig into the, uh, the cylinder heads here. This is an aluminum block, right? So that metal is soft. So you don't want to gouge into it, right? And then create points where it could leak even more. And then um, I wrap it up with brake cleaner fluid just to get all the, uh, or as much as possible of the residue off. So these surfaces are important. And then uh, these on the front and the back, this is where the biggest problem with the seal is gonna occur. And here in the corners, we're gonna put some RTV front and back. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. So something I noticed when I was cleaning off these surfaces, this port on the very end there, you see that silver residue? Um, I'm not exactly positive, but I think that is bars leak, which are pellets that you can use to stop radiator leaks. It doesn't have the consistency of oil, um, and that's the output. This is the inboard side that comes directly from the radiator. Much cleaner, um, you know, a little bit of, uh, actually this isn't even residue, this is just part of the way it was made. But on the other side, definitely something there. And the other thing that you'll notice when I was draining my coolant is that it was very cloudy. Uh, let me show you what that looks like. So this is what my coolant that I drained out looks like. Uh, you can see it looks dirty. There's like a milky character to it. This is what it's supposed to look like. Those are not the same. So I believe there's some oil in there. I also believe that that bars leak is still circulating in the cooling system. So I am going to flush the cooling system and I've already got my coolant and distilled water to do that. Um, I won't be going over how to do that in this video. I will take some videos of when I do that and post that as a separate link, but not to waste anybody's time who's just interested in the manifold gasket replacement. I'll, uh, I'll post those pictures or those videos separately. Next up, now that we're sure all this is nice and clean, we are going to put a bead of RTV in each of these corners, front and back. I'll show you what that looks like in a second uh, when it's done. Um, but basically in a line down this crease right here where the uh, cylinder block meets the uh, engine block, right? That's the head gasket that mates these two together. That's part of it. So this will just be additional insurance that there's no leaks there between the head gasket and the manifold gasket. So the gasket that I'm using, I've had really good luck with. This is the Felpro MS92808-1. It includes the uh, intake manifold gasket. And what I like about it is that it includes that retaining clip and the rubber all in one piece. So you don't have to reuse um, anything except for those bolts with the 10 millimeter heads on them. Uh, and it includes a set for the upper intake manifold, which in this case I'm not gonna use, but it includes six of those. So an entire kit to do the upper intake manifold. 
The last thing you're going to need is the actual RTV. Um, sometimes I'm a stickler for details. I'm using the Mopar RTV. Fairly cheap, nothing really fancy about it. Um, but you'll put a quarter inch bead in each of those four corners. A uh, quarter inches is uh, pretty <laughs> substantial. Uh, and then the last thing that we will do is torque those 10 millimeter bolts down to hold the gasket in place. And those will be 105 inch pounds. I always give torque specs when I do these videos. So 105 inch pounds. Um, I'll do the RTV, show you what that looks like. And then I'll put the gasket on and tighten those down and show you what the finished product looks like. So here are the beads. Uh, not my best work, honestly. Uh, this one, this one looks pretty good. That one's got a little bit of the edges on it. Um, same down here, but again, just right there in the corners. And then we're gonna set that gasket right on top of there and tighten down those end seal retainers. There we go, nice and pretty and clean. Everything's in. 105 inch pounds on those seal retainers. And then the next thing we're gonna do is drop in the upper intake manifold. Um, one thing I did do that I didn't show in the video was cleaned up the upper manifold. Um, I vacuumed it out earlier before I took it off, but I just gave it an extra rinse and uh, also cleaned up the same surfaces that mate to the gasket here just like we did on the surfaces of the uh, the cylinder heads right there. So same idea, scraper, brake cleaner. Uh, I would suggest not using a paper towel, especially if you're using brake cleaner, it just disintegrates the paper towel and you don't want any of that stuff getting in here because these are the intakes. So anything that goes in here goes into your cylinder. Um, you know, minor stuff, no big deal, but uh, you definitely don't want big chunks of paper inside of there. So I would recommend some kind of cotton cloth of some type, preferably one that doesn't shed a lot. So we set the lower intake manifold back in there. You can see the gasket. Um, you, you can't really mess that up. I mean, it uh, when it is in the right spot, you'll know it it doesn't want to move forward or backward. It sits in there nice and snug and literally just sets in there and then waits for us to put the bolts back in. So there is a sequence that we need to be mindful of when we torque this back down to prevent any leaks. And basically the way that it works, if you remember, there's eight bolts, two on the end, two here, two there, two on the other end. The sequence is number one, so passenger side, but not the far back. So second one in passenger side, and then diagonal across, number two. Back over here, driver's side, number three. Over here, number four. Then we do number five, which is the driver's side in the very back, that's number five. Number six, we come all the way back up front to this guy here, the stud bolt. That's number six. Number seven, all the way back, passenger side. And then number eight, the final one, is the one in the front. So basically crisscross, crisscross, middle to end. The torque spec on these is 200 inch pounds. So we will torque these down, and uh, then we're ready to go to the next step. So I'm just gonna hand tighten these first. And remember, with that order that I just gave you, because we're doing it with the fuel rail still on and we have to come from the opposite side, those numbers I gave you, starting with one over here, you actually come in to do number one. Um, and really, when you're just kind of hand tightening them, the order isn't super important. And you 
definitely don't want to be using a ratchet or impact wrench or anything on these because you want to make sure you don't strip anything out. Again, remember this engine block is aluminum, so uh, you can cause yourself a real headache if you're not careful. And the last thing to do is just to torque them down in that order and uh, to 200 inch pounds. Okay, everything is torqued down. Next step is to reconnect the electrical harness. That's the one, if you remember, we unplugged from over here, routed this way and here. So what you'll be connecting uh, for now are all of the fuel injectors, the coolant temperature sensor, the sensor that's down here that I forgot the name of, and the one that goes around here and down into the, uh, we can get to from the fender liner. So we will connect all that stuff back up. There'll be a few things that we're not connecting. The um, air temp sensor that goes on the throttle body, that'll be left loose. I believe that is it. Oh, the map sensor we will not be connecting yet either. Next thing is to reconnect the two radiator hoses. We've got the one down here that's off camera right now. And then we've got this one here. So just standard uh, hose clamps, put them back on.
Final step will be to put on the uh, fuel rail connector, put the, basically reconnect the fuel back into the system, and then set the upper manifold back on top. Um, in this case, I did use the new gaskets that I got from that Felpro kit. I won't go into too much detail on that here because I have another video that goes over that, but uh, we'll uh, take care of that right now. Okay, last step for the actual manifold. We will be doing a similar crisscross pattern to how we did on the lower manifold. I go over this in my other video. I'm just gonna do this once really quick for this one, but the order is number one, crossover number two, crossover here number three, crossover here number four. And then come back to the front, number five, number six, way in the back, number seven, and way in the back, number eight. Those two in the very back, you can't even see. Uh, that's when that universal joint comes in handy. These are 10 millimeter bolts, and the torque spec is 105 inch pounds. I'm not gonna go over the reconnecting of all the hoses and the EGR and all that that is in my other video. After we're done with this and we've reconnected everything, the last step will be to refill the coolant. Um, I will do that in a separate video, and if not, there's a hundred other videos on how to do your cooling. I'm gonna be flushing mine because of those issues I had with the bars leak in there and potentially oil from the manifold leak. And then the very last thing to do, reconnect your battery. One thing to keep in mind, when you do start this up, there is no fuel in that fuel rail. It'll choke a little bit when you try and crank it when that fuel pump kicks in and then starts to push fuel into the fuel rail. So don't get nervous if it you know, stutters and sputters and, and doesn't sound real good. Uh, that should even out, uh, assuming there's no other problems. Um, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this and uh, look forward to the next one.